you, Greg. As you can see, it's a we'll have a bit of a, a more intimate lighting for for this particular session. Uh, I think it's very fitting uh, to to our talk. Um, so I will be talking about the protein ligand interaction dataset and evaluation resource, as you can already see on the screen. Um, so my name is Vlado Zelenikovas, and I'm from Vant AI uh, company. So brief brief outline from my talk is well, first of all, um, I'll just give a motivation. Why do you think we need this? And um, then I'll go a bit into the details of how it was made and uh, what are the key features as well as what is next. And uh, hopefully it will all make sense, but uh, now we have a bit of an extra time also for questions, so. <laughs> or coffee. <laughs> so um, also worth mentioning that uh, Plinder is a result of a very uh, much a cross collaboration effort between um, several companies, several institutions across different, uh, uh, well, continents. Um, it is still ongoing and, and kind of as you will see, like there'll be quite a few things potentially still in progress and maybe you have uh, great ideas and suggestions. So I'll do welcome to kind of reach out and kind of like, and see maybe you can also join this uh, privileged list of uh, institutions. Um, so now jumping straight into why on earth we need another data set. And uh, the, you know, there are so many great ones. Um, but uh, as we see, like there are a lot of uh, machine learning applications that are currently being trained on protein ligand uh, data sets. And those include a variety of tasks. And some of them are quite seemingly useful, like uh, docking or flexible pocket docking, especially. I think that's called more relevant. Um, pocket conditioned ligand generation, as well as um, also an interesting feature ligand conditioned protein engineering. So, kind of like you can pick a ligand and generate a protein about to bind it. So it kind of it's the inverse of, of, of a typical uh, generative problem. Um, the list here is not exhaustive and as well as kind of I'm sure like we're working on some more fancy applications. Um, but what we identified, it's kind of like there are a few things missing that we believe as kind of as a, as a small uh, collaboration circle, uh, but hopefully this is also shared across the community that uh, in order to progress, we need to kind of improve a little bit on the training set diversity, as well as kind of like the leakage of information between the training and test set in order to evaluate these. Uh, finally, the test set quality has very profound uh, effect on our evaluation. I'll, I'll show a couple of examples, as well as kind of test set needs to be diverse. Like, I mean, if we only predict the same kind of molecules, uh, it's not going to really tell us much about how generalizable it is, as well as uh, how, what kind of, you know, performance you can expect it in, in real life applications. And finally, not, not least important is kind of realistic inference scenarios. So kind of like oh, most of the um, studies are limited still to redocking to exactly the same receptor. So kind of like, uh, so we'll, we'll touch these all in detail, but I just kind of yeah, and also for the field to progress, we need to know what is the evaluation, how what is the state of the art in here. So like we will touch on it about the metrics and then leaderboard. So we'll start from the beginning and let's see how it's made. So first of all, we need to ingest in order to kind of provide something else. So like let's go directly into it. So Plinder takes the PDB next gen archive uh, that is uh, being deposited. Um, in regular and in time intervals. It takes the annotations that are present in the SIF files um, to generate biological assemblies. From there, we extract the PLI system, protein ligand uh, systems, which include ligands as we recognize them, and the protein chains are within a certain distance. Our current cutoff that we use is six angstroms. Um, we also, as a result of this, we build the systems as individual files that are a bit cleaned up and kind of like they are saved into receptor SIFs and we still provide the PDB just to kind of for the, some some people that want to use it. Um, but uh, we also uh, provide the SDF files for ligands uh, with fixed bonding. Um, I'll show a few examples. Um, we do also quite 
uh, a lot of annotations. So kind of we look at the protein properties, we look at the pocket properties, we a, we kind of like we look at the ligand uh, uh, characteristics. We we look at kind of at the quality. Overall, it's kind of like it can be approximately seemed about five hundred annotations that are can be generated for this. And I think we constantly rethink new ones that we could add. But at the same time, like maybe we should remove some of them if it's kind of redundant. So it's kind of like um, don't be too hung up on this five hundred number. <laughs> it might be. A different one a bit later, um, but why is it important? So, like uh, the key objective that we want with this data, it's kind of like it's, it takes a lot of effort to generate, and it is highly valuable. It's still very scarce, and it we shouldn't be limited by our inability to ingest it. So, kind of like we're trying to overcome some of the issues, and even like recently, recent publications that are constantly using. Uh, some pre-created versions like a PDB bind. Like here, they they do kind of drop nearly 10% of the systems just because of uh, some issues with the files. And even though it's, it's supposed to be pre-created for some um, more higher quality uh, structures. Um, interestingly, like many of them do cite our DKIT. And uh, in this case, in the context where like say, oh, like we, we're not able to process it or uh, it couldn't be able to generate uh, the RD um, confirm or something like that. So like, it's it's a bit kind of like, we were looking into this. Uh, so I'm kind of pretty pleased to say that uh, all of the Plinder systems, so all of the Plinder ligands can be loaded into our DKIT and can be successfully saved to SDF and can even be loaded back. So we can't, and, and those include a much bigger superset of uh, these uh, structures that we included in PDB binds. So like, uh, I think it's, Maybe not necessarily entirely our DKIT's fault, uh, but uh, um, what what we want is obviously not everyone has to be an our DKIT wizard in order to uh, train their models on on these tasks. So we want to make it accessible, and 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 uh, that that's the key. So some of our DKIT magic that we do. So like uh, one of the important things is kind of like, um, and we've been even asked by a reviewer, well, isn't this uh, the same data is already available? So like what's what's new about this data set? So uh, it's it's making it more usable, more accessible. So one of the important things, we take the smiles from a uh, chemical component dictionary and we use it to assign the bonds. So kind of like if you take um, your know, structures, oftentimes it, it it has to do some certain processing where it kind of infers a little bit of the bonding. Here we precisely um, try to assign to what the offers uh, indicated that they included in their structure. Um, so we cannot help if the offers have misassigned their chemistries. So that's kind of still a limitation. But, uh, but at least in this way, we can provide some certain way of consistency with uh, source information. And uh, that uh, it should be less variable between like what kind of rules you use to infer the bonding and, and how you prepare your structure. So we pre-assign the bonds. And we're using a, a great uh, tool of uh, assigned bond orders from templates. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so as you can see, it, the results would be vastly different if we took a raw file like this and we tried to kind of like generate a conformer and dock it. I'm, I'm pretty sure like the interactions would be fairly different. I don't know if everyone is here a chemist, but I'll assume and be ignorant of uh, uh, I need, don't need to explain it. <laughs> so, um, another thing is like the sanitization routine. And then this is like, uh, uh, does uh, make a lot of us uh, issues and then you try to um, characters. And all. So some of the uh, smiles are not necessarily precisely defined and, and or not defined in a way that is canonically preferred. And then and, and in this case, it could be like a quaternary, uh, like a, nitrogens and it's also some calculation exception so i show here a couple um our decad can load it uh, and and make it but once you try to kind of like do something more of it sometimes it's it drops with errors because of the kind of it's not fully sanitized molecule um so we kind of seem to be getting around to it we do use um two lines of, of maybe something some of the code that might soon be <laughs> 
um, redundant. <laughs> so set num explicit hydrogens is, is used in in here. Uh, so so we'll, we'll I'm sure. Uh, so good news, we fix it. It works. You can see over here on 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 the right hand side. Um, but uh, the other good news <laughs> is that if it breaks in the future, like we'll still fix it. So. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So uh, another thing, it's, it's about the hydrogens and like uh, hydrogens, of course, is MS. And I don't know, like uh, I assume majority of you are still chemists. So like, um, do you, can you spot anything off in the, in the small girl? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I see a lot of uh, finger pointing. Uh, Okay. Um, so, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, like, it's, it, it's, um, very, very unfortunate that kind of like it's, there's no consistency for this and kind of like, and, um, a lot of, uh, hydrogens that are present in the models are not, and too often not supported by ex experimental data and also not necessarily consistently added and not necessarily consistently named. So it causes all sorts of issues. And uh, for that reason, at, at this point, we choose to remove them carefully um, by, while retaining the, the bonding annotations. Um, it, a majority of uh, ma uh, machine learning methods use uh, molecular graphs without explicit hydrogen. So that is not the top of our objective, but this file should also be um, hopefully compatible with classical methods as well to be ingested and use uh, using the standard protonation routines. Uh, we do a lot of uh, quality annotations and the reason for that is, as you can seen before, like in, in the structure, but, uh, but it, even without hydrogen, there's sometimes missing densities and could be for legitimate reasons, uh, like uh, proteins can be mobile. Sometimes maybe the data set is, is not fully collected. Um, variety of, uh, in, you know, missing density that uh, leads to not fully resolved ligand atoms or missing residues, missing entire loops. Um, some, some of the models also do introduce bundles clashes and some of them have alternative locations I can see in, in here. So um, it all causes a bit of a pain because while it is a data, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit difficult to tell unambiguously what is the ground truth here. And like when, if, if you're placing a ligand and then you need to provide a scoring uh, for your placement, um, you would have different results. So it's, it's kind of like here, um, we don't necessarily do use this for filtering or trimming the data set in any way, but we annotate it. So this is accessible to the users if they decide that we want to train only on high quality data, that is possible. Um, we do, however, do care about that uh, quality of evaluation of the methods. So our test sets only contain high quality structures. So um, in that way, uh, the evaluation is on, on unambiguous uh, ground truth. And despite all of that, um, so after the curation, we do um, seem to be able to successfully expand uh, the existing, pre-existing data sets uh, to a good degree, um, just a bit over 10 times. So as you can see, uh, currently uh, Plinder contains uh, 450,000 uh, um, PLI systems. Uh, out of those, uh, they derive some, they are, not all derived from unique PDB. So if you look at the table behind me, uh, you can see that uh, the PDB IDs are only about like 110 uh, or 11. Um, many of the systems pass the quality, but you, as you can see, uh, it is only a f like about 25%. So it's kind of, it's a, still a fraction. So, but uh, we do have uh, a much bigger number of unique smiles, uh, unique CCD codes, which is another way of uh, proxying um, what is a unique chemical component. Um, we are also a couple of other annotations here, like CAF, uh, SCOP, and ECOD. Uh, um, so these are all kind of like protein annotation domains for protein diversity. Um, we annotate also what kinase inhibitors on like if the protein is kinase. We also provide links to uh, apo structures, which is also an important thing because 
you need those in order to do a realistic scenario where you dock to a previously unliganded uh, bucket. And um, as you can see on the Cosmograph over here, so this is our Blender data set. So it's kind of like it's colored uh, by, um, I think that's at least by these colors, <laughs> but, uh, but also with a majority of, uh, of the systems that they extract that single protein, single ligand. There's some that are multi-ligand, but that includes also sometimes like if you, if you have uh, some of uh, like small uh, fragments or cofactors or, or something like that, uh, we also count them as, as ligands because they can be represented as such. Um, we have multi-proteins kind of where the ligand happens to be in proximity to more than one protein chain. And we have also a little bit of a multi both so kind of where you have a, more than one ligand and more than one protein at the interface. Um, so uh, now going forwards, uh, uh, what we do is, is once we collect this data, we need to have a way of comparing it. So because uh, we, I said that we care about kind of like our train and test similarity would be not too similar so that you can kind of relate on, on the generalization. So how do we do that? We need to have a way of comparing our systems. So, but again, what is different is a very, <laughs> a very, a, a, or what is similar is kind of like, it's a, it's a very open discussion and can be also for different contexts, different tasks. So, but we try to kind of like come up with, uh, for example, you can have same protein, same pocket, different ligand. These are different systems, yes, but uh, depending on what is your task, uh, some of that information might be considered to be information leakage. So if you want to detect the binding site, then clearly this is telling a bit too much if these were one of them was in train and one was in, in, in test, then you could easily just memorize this protein. Another case, you can have a different protein, different pocket, same ligand. Um, this is again like if you do docking, maybe you don't care too much, but if you do ligand generation, that could be a problem. And then we have cases where um, same protein, different pocket, different ligand. So that is in some ways is also a valid, unique um, data point. But for example, if you do co-folding, where you simultaneously predict the protein ligand and protein structure um, from scratch, there's quite a lot of protein information contained in, in, in that structure. So you, we have to kind of consider all of this. And you can also have cases where two these systems compared have uh, very little in common. So kind of like in that case, you could say like a different all or completely novel. So, so this is kind of like the way we've been thinking about this. And we were using some of the uh, uh, open source community tools as well. So like uh, to do this comparison, all versus all. And we use FoldSeq and MSeqs to compare the protein chains for the sequence and, and their fold identity to map their sequences. And then from those, we can extract them pockets and then we can compare the pockets. And then from, um, we can also run a protein ligand interaction profiler and to compare the interactions uh, and map them to the sequence and see how many of those interactions are shared between proteins that may not be even so similar, but they might have a similar domain somewhere where it kind of has a very similar pocket and making very similar interactions. For ligands, we currently like, well, it's it's not perfect, but we're using a ECFP fingerprint and with any motor similarity. So, like, it's, <laughs> so it's kind of like, it still could be improved. Um, and then overall, it's, it's kind of like 14 similarity metrics at the moment uh, that provide all versus all. It's kind of like it's over 20 billion of uh, scores. Um, we can use these scores to build graphs, uh, and those graphs can be used for clustering, and for those clusters can be used for um, later splitting. Uh, but wait for it for a little bit. Um, um, just kind of like overall, when coming back to the beautiful Cosmograph, um, we can also like see how Blender, PDB, by and DocGen compare in terms of kind of like Blender definitely seems to uh, extend um, the, the the space quite a lot. There's a lot of pink. That is not previously sampled by the green and blue. Um, you can also see that uh, there's systems that also have various sorts of ligands. So both that are Lipinski, that are covalent, that are cofactors, that oligos, that are other or are ions. They can can be colored. Um, 
what we include in the test also, and then some of the ECOT topologies, so different proteins also like uh, uh, included in this. So uh, that's all nice and good, but how can we use this for providing splits? Well, like hopefully the best ever splits or something like that, um, at least towards that. So what we want is we want to maximize the test quality and diversity, as well as mi minimizing the information leakage. Um, we also like, we maybe cannot fully leak for every uh, similarity there is known, but we can maybe provide some stratifications and kind of like and, and provide sets that would be more suitable to evaluate different uh, methods and tasks. So we de devised uh, the team a novel algorithm for optimal train val test splitting. Um, it's a bit dense, uh, but in, the principle is simple. You just basically create a graph of the similarities that you care about. And, and then you just look at the connectivities uh, in order to initialize, we start. We want to have quality tests, so we start just basically take all the quality systems and 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 we look at. Um, how, so like this is going through here. Like we, we can loop over systems and say if it passes the quality, then look at this graph. Is it connected to the neighbors? So those neighbors by degree of one, if we decided that is the depth of the network that we want to do, they would be considered leaked if we have. If if I'm connected to some systems through some similarity graph, that means those are leaked. So, so in this case, we can actually count how many of our high quality structures would have leakage. We don't want to trim away and throw away all of the uh, um, trains training sets. So we kind of want to minimize, but at the same time, we don't want to pick um, systems that are so unique that they be kind of like outliers. So we define this kind of min and max uh, for kind of removal to kind of have a bit of a balance. And, and this way we insert uh, them into our proto test system. And then we can also do some additional analysis. In, in the end, basically both systems that are um, leaked between the train and, and test are removed. And in this way, uh, we should get a, a clean uh, training set. So how does it look? In, uh, the actual results. Uh, so here, um, oh, and then I forgot to include the um, configuration that we use. So we used a um, thirty uh, percent um, sequence similarity of a protein uh, as a graph with a single linkage. So thirty percent similarity, not not identity similarity, because it's important. Um, and another uh, graph that we used was uh, protein ligand interaction. Uh, similarity. So that was also at the 30%. Uh, so kind of like, but no um, proteins and, and, and kind of like no, no similar proteins, no similar pockets should be uh, shared. So this largely works nicely. Um, and, and then we can see that we managed to generate uh, a nice split where test versus train. Um, we, we have, a, we compare all the test systems and we got a thousand test system and 832 um, valve systems. And then we compare them against uh, the 300,000 train systems available and look how many of them are novel in terms of a protein, ligand, pocket, and PLI uh, that are all of the above um, and, uh, or none. So majority of, of it is uh, unique in terms of a pocket, uh, extreme majority. Uh, but the ligand, obviously, like we have only 50,000 unique ligands in, in our PDB. So it is not really possible to have a, a large set that would be uh, completely leaked. Uh, so like if we impose strict rules on that, um, it would be quite difficult uh, because it would be left with less training data. Um, I also note that there is a feature that we have not as strictly delete the val versus train, and it has actually a good use, but uh, we can jump a bit later. So, the, oh, so there it is, like the plunder split, the current uh, version two, uh, the best so far, released uh, just kind of um, less than a month ago. Um, that's kind of like what the depth one, and you can see um, we um, included a lot of uh, good, unique, um, Test systems that have a lot of a high diversity by number of 
uh, CCD codes, the ligand communities and, and PLI communities and pocket communities train is quite large. Um, but we did have to sacrifice nearly 10, uh, nearly 100,000 of, of systems to, to be removed. Not because we were bad, but we had some of them were actually quite high in quality, but that's just entirely just to make sure that um, we couldn't have them all in test. So, but but we also cannot really put them anywhere else in train or val. So like, it is just a, a compromise that you have to make if you want to make a good quality split and in order to evaluate your methods. So is it representative of ligand types? Uh, fortunately it is. Um, it's kind of like, as you can see distributions, um, are somewhat within the same ranges, um, no taken. Um, and um, you can also see that, you know, like we can be bad, but in order for them to be unique, you can also want to see that they are not somewhere like far outliers and like some, so on. So if you look at the cosmograph, but only for the ligands, um, you can see that the gray ones are the ones that, that are only in train. The, the blue ones that are in train uh, and val or val only, whereas what the pink ones that are only unique in test. And they, these are kind of like roughly scaled by size of those clusters, but this is like a lot of data. So like uh, it's, it's probably like not really very easy to say if it's 10 or 20, but, um, but kind of like it, it gives you um, hopefully a pretty good view but kind of we have our test systems that are not all clustered in one weird corner uh, and that are not all overlapping. So you can see it's, it's, it provides a, a fairly good diversity from this picture, at least. Uh, a snapshot also just kind of, like of using them all grids. Uh, so we can see that uh, our ligands here and like we also like annotate. So this is part of our assessment of a, of a test. We can also look at how those ligands look. So I kind of like to um, provide this report and, and we look at the system ID at the top of the actual image of the ligand, as well as kind of like the uh, cluster, ligand community cluster ID, uh, pocket the ligand community, so PLI interaction uh, cluster ID, as well as we have a number, which is kind of like it's red if it's above 30, uh, because it's, it means like it has um, something that is closer than 0.3 Tanimoto. In, in the train. So um, some of them are leaked, some of them are unique. So now that we have this way of looking, uh, this is kind of like where we can evaluate. And this is, I promised there was a bit of a train involved. So it kind of, we did train on the earlier version of this. Like we worked with our collaborators from NVIDIA and we retrained the commonly used method DiffDoc and using three different splitting strategies. So one of them was what was used in the past as like time split, as we know, it's uh, another one was used, it's, it's much stricter using ECOD where you split by the protein domain annotation. So no single domain is appears in, in, in kind of train and test. So it's kind of like fairly unique. And um, what you can see on, on the graph, like if you base our success, if I can reproduce a pose of it in the top 10, so at least one of them is less than two angstroms away. Um, you can see that time split does perform a lot better. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you use strict splits like ECOD or PL50, so this is here like pocket uh, LDDT50 split. This was an early iteration, so I apologize. We'll get to new results later. Um, so you can see it kind of like the performance drops to kind of more like of 25%. And we think this is kind of a baseline uh, performance for this. Um, we also noted a big uh, change between the high and low quality. So like this is, if you include only high quality systems, the performance is much better because it's kind of, it's less ambiguous in terms of a placing. So like, a, um, but uh, before like, you, as you can see for the time split where we didn't do any care of curation for the quality, you see a lot of fluctuation between this, but, uh, but really your uh, benchmark should contain high quality unambiguous structures. Uh, another commonly used uh, uh, set of our evaluation is pose busters. Here we did nothing to delete it in either of, a, um, of a, um, uh, our strategies. Uh, and as you can see, um, the performance is much higher, but is it really because of uh, 
generalization. So because we can evaluate, we, we can also use uh, similarities to, to look into performance. And, and uh, I'll start wrapping up, I see, I see my notes. Um, so like, uh, as you can see, we, we can look at, based on these similarities with distance train, we can also actually see the performance enrichment. And, and this, uh, this evaluation harness can provide you a good way of uh, evaluating your method and, and how well it performs and whatever sensitive information leakage that, that you should uh, be looking at. And the one of the caution is like, it would likely be very different between the tasks or models, or also if you change your definition of success, it might also change. But uh, as you can see for DivDog here, it was almost a dose saturation curve in terms of um, the PLI information shared. Um, then here, as a kind of like for evaluation, we can, um, provide this evaluation uh, harness where we actually use, um, we can go beyond our MSD success rate. We actually like looking into metrics used by CASP. So this LDD PLI. Um, the important part is also going uh, towards realistic inference scenarios. So as you can see, um, like the APO confirmation is, is vastly, can be vastly different. So if you want to assess it in a real scenario, uh, you need to, link it with APO, but also you need to augment your training. So kind of that your training does, doesn't get only, only sees hollows and then you, infer, you do inference only on APOs, it will also get, get confused. So it needs to be part of your training routines. The next things for Blender, like more data, uh, more regular updates, uh, better user experience with data loaders. And um, we also doing a leaderboard uh, that will be in collaboration with MLSB. Um, we also want to, to do um, the baseline performance with a physics-based method. So anyone who's kind of interesting potentially to collaborate on that is also welcome. And we remain open to that. Um, so just placing this for challenge. Uh, we do also provide a training workshop, um, but this will be available. In, I'll share the slides after. So like, but just quick acknowledgements for uh, our teams. And like, this is only likely to grow in the future. And if you have any quick questions, I can still answer them. We have time for just maybe two or three questions. First to comment, as I was one of the people who originally came up with that RMSD to angstroms, I really apologize to the community. You really shouldn't do it use electron density. It was in 2002, and we didn't have electron densities maps in those days. But I'm not quite sure, how are you handling multimeric proteins, where the binding site is actually between two, tray, two, two, two of the monomers, like in ligand-gated iron channels? Yeah, so like uh, for multimeric assemblies, uh, you would still have to, if your method is predicting from de novo, it's, it's actually relatively easy. You just provide the two sequences, and, and, and a smile on your co-folding algorithm should do give you the whole structure. <laughs> but, but if you actually go approach it in more classical terms, when you need to provide two different APOs, you need to provide a, a ligand, and then it would have to perform an elaborate uh, routine of probably doing both a protein docking and ligand docking um, at the same time. So it's, it's fairly complex with uh, classical methods because we have not been devised to necessarily to handle all those different optionalities. Um, but with uh, modern methods, uh, it's it's more accessible thanks to query. Thanks. Uh, can we come back just to the sanitization problem? Oh yes. Uh, maybe we can handle this uh, offline. Uh, no, but it's it's, it's no? not for you. It's for Greg. In fact. <laughs> no, my 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 comment here is only that that this is really a local problem. So you solve only for the. Uh, the nitrogen, not, but not for the other cases. So I, I think we really need to think how to solve it globally because uh, it touch every tools that use RD kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get like 15 seconds. Um, so the problem here is that the input data is garbage. The input data is wrong. Um, and the RD kit does not try and fix wrong input data. And the reason it does that is because a human being needs to look at that and figure out what is correct. If we guess, we're going to be wrong probably half the time. And then you will have a molecule that goes through your sanitization pipeline and will still be wrong and you won't know. 
So what it does here, the RDCAD has very simple rules to recognize cases that are obviously wrong. You can fix those by hand as a human being who understands what's going on, and then the RDCAD will deal with it. We are never going to add automatic fixing of this because it will be wrong, and we care about data quality. If you don't care about data quality as much as we do, you can fix it yourself. So this is never going to change. It's something I feel very strongly about. And I hope people appreciate where I'm coming from. So I care about data quality. If you don't, you can fix it yourself. 